4 plus 2 plus a possible 3 or 4 equals, what, 9 or 10. If a second ceasefire extension holds, it will have been well over a week since the respite began for the daily pounding of the Gaza Strip. It's pressure from hostages' families that forced Israel's government to prioritize the return of loved ones above uh, revenge when it comes to October 7th, the bloodiest day in the country's history. These are images of uh, the latest batch of hostages from Gaza who'd been uh, uh, released a short while ago. What hap what's happened since the guns have gone quiet, desperately needed aids entered a Gaza that's still under blockade, although not enough to make up for the destruction and displacement of a population on an epic scale. Uh, will it really be a return to massive airstrikes when the deadline passes? What's the alternative? Uh, that's largely the decision of Israel's hard-right government, which for now is negotiating with Hamas indirectly, but won't settle for anything less than forceful removal from the Gaza Strip. Can this be done without killing thousands more civilians? Is there a way for Hamas to go quietly? Hard to imagine under the command of its brutal leader in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar. But with all the hard bargaining going on, are there others outside of the more radicals uh, who uh, are ready to contemplate an alternative. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the options ahead with us, France 24's Shirley Sitbon, who's been following it from the get-go. How are you? Okay, following closely the rec recent developments now. Yeah, there's plenty of uh, plenty breaking as we speak. Uh, from Ramallah, Francesca Bori, correspondent uh, for Italian newspaper La Repubblica. Thank you for being with us. Uh, from Berlin, she's a former Middle East advisor at the U.S. Defense Department, Jasmine El Gamal, CEO of MindWork Strategies. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Francois. And we welcome back from Washington, Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for including me on this excellent panel. Your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, before uh, we go to that excellent panel, let's go to Luke Schrago. He's in Tel Aviv. We just showed those images, Luke, of uh, Red Cross vehicles bringing hostages uh, who had been released uh, uh, across the Rafah crossing uh, from the Gaza Strip into Egypt back to uh, Israel. What's the latest where you are? Indeed, we heard a little earlier that uh, Hamas had handed over this latest batch of 10 hostages to the Red Cross. They were on their way to Egypt. They have now crossed over. They will be very quickly on their way back to Israeli territory, where, as we've seen with previous releases, they'll be uh, flown or bussed or, or taken to, to hospitals around the country, very much kept out of the, uh, the public eye, uh, kept uh, very much with their families uh, to be given medical evaluations. Now, that's in return for another 30 Palestinian hostages who, uh, who are being being released on Friday, 15 uh, women and, and 15 men, as much as we have seen previously. Now, we had also heard that Hamas uh, agreed to release two other hostages of uh, Russian citizenship as well. That, uh, ostensibly as a gesture, as they say, put it, to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, um, they had also been saying that they were open to prolonging this truce for another four days. Now, while Israel had been happy to accept uh, the ongoing truces for as long as uh, hostages were being released. The question now is uh, whether or not it's going to be prolonged or not. Uh, we've seen Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli Prime Minister, saying that as soon as this uh, current uh, round of uh, ex exchanges was over, that they would be going back to war. There was uh, no question of it, as he put it. We do know that uh, Israel's war cabinet is meeting on uh, Wednesday evening to decide more. Uh, we w should know more later on in the evening. But we've seen these negotiations going on in the background, particularly from Qatar mediating between Israel and Hamas, uh, with the uh, news that they were attempting to to uh, move forward towards uh, something more sustainable. Uh, they were, we were given word that they were moving towards uh, uh, the possibility of uh, an agreement on male hostages, which have still been held. And uh, what we need to know what's happening with uh, Israeli soldiers who are still being held. All these negotiations still continuing in the background. Luke Schrago, many thanks for uh, that uh, uh, update from uh, Tel Aviv. And there are images coming in. Uh, from uh, Raf of, of uh, uh, medical personnel uh, waiting for uh, releases. There you see uh, uh, images uh, courtesy of Egyptian uh, television. Um, uh, Shirley Sitbon, again, this has been the drill since what, last Friday? 
Yes, and uh, things can continue or they can be accelerated or they can be completely reversed. We're waiting to see what... Because every day, what, it's been 10 Israeli or Jewish hostages who've been released. And are there... Uh, uh, it's been women and children. Yes. Are there enough women and, uh, and children to prolong this if we continue along the current scenario? Hamas said it had 93 women and children uh, at the beginning of this, um, you know, of this exchange deal. And uh, we don't really know. I guess now they're looking at elderly men, at sick people, uh, how to reconsider the situation. And, of course, the Israelis are waiting to see what Qatar will have to say later on today because there's maybe uh, new conditions now, maybe including men or soldiers or everyone in exchange for everyone uh, the deals, uh, the terms of these deals, potential deals, will be brought forward by the mediators. Francesca Bori, uh, what's in the what's in the works? What's is it is it sticking to what, what we've seen so far, or could the terms, as Shirley was alluding to a second ago, change as we go along? Um, that might be an extension of of the ceasefire for other two days. Uh, also for other two extra days. Uh, uh, it doesn't really matter, honestly, because we all know that war is going to resume. And um, because basically both sides have, have interest, you know, to resume the war. Well, first of all, you know, Israel has been, Netanyahu, not Israel, Netanyahu has been very, very clear. And um, after, you know, the north of Gaza um, will be the turn of the south of Gaza. Uh, but uh, when it comes to Hamas on the other side, uh, look, uh, so far the prisoners who have been released are somehow minor prisoners, which means children, kids and women. Most of them, you know, uh, have been in, 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 in jail for, for just a few weeks. None of them for, you know, serious, honestly, charged. Uh, the prisoners, you know, who really Palestinians want to, to, to see out uh, are different prisoners, you know. We are speaking of leaders uh, of, you know, for, for, for the Palestinian society belonging to different factions, not only to Hamas uh, and not only to Fatah, because when we say, you know, Fatah or Hamas, then we have different wings inside Hamas or Fatah. Now, uh, I think, you know, that Hamas and the other Palestinian groups need time, you know, to agree a list of, you know, the prisoners they would like to negotiate on. And that's why, you know, at some point the ceasefire won't be extended anymore because Palestinians, first of all, have to agree, you know, uh, what prisoners uh, try to, to get out of, of jail. And it's been, uh, what is it, one for three roughly uh, that we've seen so far. Uh, we've each day the truce brings tales of reunions. You saw Luke Frego earlier uh, in Tel Aviv, where they've been rallying nightly uh, on the Israeli side, but also on the Palestinian side. Uh, take, for instance, Ruba Asi, a sociology student at Birzeit University, arrested uh, several times over her activism. Freedom, freedom is the most beautiful feeling in the world. So from the moment the prisoner is deprived of her freedom, she awaits the day when she will regain it. This freedom will only be complete when our homeland is liberated and all our prisoners are set free. Now, the most famous Palestinian activist of Asi's generation is 22-year-old Ahed Tamimi, three weeks after the arrest of Tamimi, who made headlines when she was a young teenager uh, and she confronted an Israeli soldier and slapped him. Israel last Sunday moved to place her under what's called administrative uh, detention. Administrative detention uh, means she can be held for a long time, uh, Francesca Bori, without uh, trial. Yet there's perhaps talk that she may be released. Uh, yes, she might be released. You know, she's quite a radical activist. Uh, I, I don't think, honestly, you know, that what she, you know, Palestinians think, most Palestinians think that uh, the post on, on Instagram she was, you know, accused of uh, were not basically her posts, you know, she, she doesn't have, honestly, she doesn't have a, 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 an Instagram or an account. Um, but even, you know, Haid Tamimi, when, when we speak, at, you know, the, the, the real prisoners that might change the equation, I mean, uh, we are not speaking of Haid Tamimi. She's a symbol, of course, you know, but she's not going to change the balance of power, you know, in the, in, in the Palestinian camp. 
we are speaking of Marwan Barghouti, we are speaking of this kind of names, you know. And of course, you know, Hamas uh, will, will want, will try to raise the price for this kind of prisoners, you know. Uh, so Hamas, 100% sure, will try to use the last hostages, you know, f to release uh, this kind of high profile prisoners. But again, first of all, Hamas, Hamas and Fatah, Hamas and Fatah and Islamic Jihad and all the other factions have, you know, to agree uh, which kind of prisoners to try to release. And this will have effect also on the future, uh, you know, government or whatever for the future uh, arrangement, uh, you know, both in Gaza and the West Bank. That's why this is not, this is an intra-Palestinian negotiations uh, that, you know, has to happen before uh, the Israel-Hamas negotiations. And that's why everybody's sure the ceasefire won't be extended, you know, uh, for for long, unfortunately, and won't be a permanent well, ceasefire. Won't the, be extended the, long enough for that intra-Palestinian dialogue to, to come to fruition, is what you're saying? Uh, yes, because I think that whoever is a little bit familiar with the intra-Palestinian matters know that Palestinians have been, you know, negotiating a national unity government since 2007. And uh, so, you know, it takes time. Every time, you know, you have two Palestinians at the table, takes uh, lots of time, you know, to get uh, half of the opinion agreed on. So definitely, definitely. And, and also, honestly, you know, Palestinians, even Hamas, you know, they are not even in the same place. On one side, you know, you have Israel, you have a world cabinet. Uh, the decision making, you know, inside Hamas is structurally very complicated because, you know, Hamas decide, you know, by consensus, not by majority. But now you, you have a leadership, you know, some of the leaders are in Gaza, even under the tunnels, and some of them are in Lebanon, some of them are in Doha, and uh, other Palestinian leaders, you know, are in the West Bank, other Palestinian leaders are in Gaza, but, you know, not in Hamas. So it's really not easy for the Palestinians, you know, to get any decision any decision. So it's just a matter of decision making. Uh, Hussein Ibish, if you were a betting man, uh, would you say that any of these high profile prisoners will come out anytime soon? No, I don't think so. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, I'm very skeptical of that. Uh, because I don't think Israel is in the mood to trade either senior Hamas figures that would strengthen Hamas as an organization if they were released, on the one hand, uh, or uh, Fatah leaders, national leaders uh, like Barghouti, who would be released, but Hamas get the credit for that, you see. So I think any big prisoner exchange is going to accrue to the political benefit of Hamas in the intra-Palestinian uh, struggle for power, dialogue, or conversation, etc. And I don't think the Israelis are really ready to do that yet. On the other hand, Hamas will not want to release the uniformed soldiers that they have taken, and the other groups also, um, Islamic Jihad, and even individual uh, Palestinians, whoever is holding these the soldiers, are not going to want to let them go for uh, random women and children that have just been nabbed and held without charge by Israel because, you know, frankly, the logic of occupation demands that kind of heavy-handed oppression. If you don't act like that, you can't rule over millions of people, uh, you know, because they don't want to be ruled by a few thousand hostile foreign soldiers. So you have, you know, the, the, the logic of occupation is a logic of, that requires brutality. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, had Tamimi, why has she been arrested? Uh, administrative detention means I don't have a reason to arrest you. I just wanted to arrest you. That, that's what that means. Why? Why now? Of course, so that she can be exchanged for some Israeli hostage. She's a hostage. Anyone who does not think this woman is as much a hostage as any of the uh, uh, Israelis and others held in Gaza right now is not paying attention to the logic of, of the conflict. And the fact is she's been arrested without reason and she's being held without charge. Why? So that she can be exchanged, obviously. So, some, so of those who've been, that, some of those who've been, uh, 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 the point is taken, Hussein Ibish, some of those who've been released uh, uh, have been uh, convicted of uh, uh, plotting uh, uh, attacks and uh, uh, of, of violent crimes. Well, some, uh, uh, actually not that many of them have been convicted of it. Uh, one, at least, 
uh, a lady was a famous case of accused of a terrorist action. She says no. She was never brought to trial. N most of these women and children released by Israel um, have been either administrative detainees or simply held without charge. Uh, because um, the occupation authorities give themselves the right to do that. So even in the case of this uh, lady, it was very, I can't remember her name, very high profile case where the Israelis said she tried to set off a bomb at a checkpoint when her, her um, car exploded. And she says, no, there was a fire in my car. She was never brought to trial. That suggests that the Israelis actually really don't know if it was or not. But uh, since they have the authority to just nab Palestinians and keep them without charge, uh, that's what they did. And I really don't think we've gotten to the release of anybody on either side who is considered a major asset by Israel or Hamas and who is considered a threat by Israel or Hamas. And when we get to those people, it's going to be much, much more difficult to get a deal done. So I'm not holding my breath. Jasmine El Kamal, you agree? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, I, I just want to say hello to my friend Hussein from across the ocean. It's nice to see hello. you. And Hussein is making very, very good points, as is Francesca. I mean, we are now looking at a situation where we simply don't know what the truth is. We don't know who, you know, the people that are being released, the charges against them, by the Israeli government, Francois, and I, I don't say this, you know, as I don't say this lightly, you know, I, I uh, am familiar with with the, the you know, the, the terms that Hussein just mentioned, you know, administrative detention, indefinite detention. Uh, when I was when I was 24 years old, I worked as a translator in Guantanamo Bay for a year and a half translating statements between detainees and American uh, law judges. And so I understand what these terms mean. And what Hussein is saying is absolutely right. When you hold someone in administrative detention, when you hold someone indefinitely without charge, that means that you're using them for a political cause. It's not about justice anymore. It's about politics. And I think that's what we really need to focus on when we talk about these hostages and the debate around exchanges. Who is being held for what reason and what purpose? And by the way, just one last point that I, that I want to make on this, the Israeli government, they're sending uh, lists of names to journalists via WhatsApp. And the, the headline, the title of the list is every day, Palestinian terrorists released today. That is not a correct terminology. That is a very, very incorrect terminology. Most of these people that are being released have not even been charged. So it's really important, I think, to not lose sight of that. Shoy Sipan, what's the mindset in Israel right now when it comes to all this? It, they're very divided, uh, and the situation has not become any clearer, and the divisions are even more important now after these few days of, uh, of truce. Uh, we've seen f f the population. Before the war, of course, uh, the families of the hostages managed to get public support to push the government to negotiate and to have this, uh, this uh, truce and this exchange, which the government did not want to do. At first, its first goal was to uh, annihilate Hamas, get it out of the Gaza Strip. Well, now we're seeing uh, people coming back. First of all, uh, the Israeli operation was suspended. So some people are saying that, you know, the, the, there's not as much uh, strength behind it. Not they, they lost momentum in some way. And the population now sees more people being freed. So they want to see more of that. Uh, and they do know that the Palestinians being released, as the other guests have been saying, are not huge threats for Israel. So they want this to go on as long as possible. And one of the first uh, women hostages who were released was demonstrating yesterday in Tel Aviv for her husband to be released. And she had a poster saying, we want everyone in exchange for everyone, basically saying that they want all of the hostages to be released for all of the Palestinian prisoners, which is, of course, her position. She's a left winger, uh, and she's al always talked about two-state solution, and she's always uh, talked in favor of the residents of Gaza, of course. But that's something you, you can hear, and more and more Israelis want to see everyone being freed. They've seen other people come back, and they want their own loved ones and other people to come back as well.
All right, and as you know, Israel's not just made up of left wingers. Uh, <laughs> for those uh, rooting for a truce extension to beget a more uh, permanent ceasefire, don't hold your breath. That was the message this Wednesday from Israel's prime minister. In the last few days, I heard a question. After this phase of returning our objectives is finished, will Israel return to fighting? My answer is unequivocally yes. There is no chance that we won't resume the fighting until the end. This is my policy. The entire cabinet stands behind it. The entire government stands behind it. The soldiers stand behind it. The people stand behind it. This is exactly what we will do. Now, Shirley Sitball, let's briefly delve into domestic politics here, because just a few hours earlier, um, one of his far-right cabinet members, the very controversial Itamar Ben Gavir, threatened to bring down the government Thank you. if uh, they hadn't, uh, if they if they didn't go back to uh, resuming the war uh, in Gaza. So, is this what you just heard, a bit of bluster, or is that the game plan? Well, with Netanyahu, you never know, but that's what they've been saying all along. Uh, because if they stop now, if, if they continue to talk about uh, a, a longer ceasefire, then for the Israelis, there's a feeling for people like Netanyahu, of course, who, who believe their goal is to get Hamas out of the Gaza Strip, even though everyone says that's basically impossible without having great numbers of victims and even impossible altogether. Well, for him, stopping now would be a, a defeat. Hamas would, would, would show that it's still there even after its historic attack, uh, which has never happened before. It's still there. It's surviving. Uh, actually, some people actually think I've seen the return of hostages, which means Hamas is not that inhumane. I mean, of course, quote unquote, some people could see it that way. Uh, so for Benjamin Netanyahu and the right wing and far right government he has, this would be a defeat. So basically, he has to move on with this according to his own law. Logic. And many Israelis see that if Hamas does stay in the Gaza Strip, stays in control, the new attacks can happen. It's not just revenge. It's also they feel unsafe. Even the people from Beirut, even the left wingers we were talking about, they're saying we're not going back home as long as the threat is still there. So, uh, yes, I think he does believe that's what he has to do. But the things have changed in the past few days. There's more pressure. Of course, Israel cannot continue its operation as it's been uh, doing before. Uh, you know, the Americans, the European allies, they cannot back an operation that is as, as brutal and brings as many victims. Okay, and as brings many victims. And just briefly on this, uh, is Itamar Ben-Gavir bluffing? Um, I think that's really his position. He voted against the deal to bring the hostages back. So that's that's what that's his position. That's he always said uh, that, um, and that was his position from the beginning. When the fa hostages' families were saying, "We want to see our loved ones back." A very small, uh, you know, some families, maybe of four hostages, said, we're ready to sacrifice our loved ones for the good of the nation, for a massive war against Hamas. And that's something that Ben Gvir is rooting for. The others, of course, not. But that was something that was heard at the beginning. Ben Gvir, that's his position. He wants to destroy Hamas. He wants an all-out war. That's something he's been saying, and I believe that's what he really wants. Francesca Bori, we heard earlier at the uh, United Nations in New York, the U.S. ambassador uh, to the U.N., uh, very outspokenly denouncing uh, uh, West Bank settlement activities. And that's who Ben Gvir, uh, that's his constituency. Um, do you feel as though... The tide is turning against uh, those uh, far-right parties that are propping up the Netanyahu government? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think this is um, one of the major effects and probably lasting effects of, of October 7. Um, these, um, I mean, change uh, in international um, public opinion, but also, you know, governments, uh, there is for sure much more awareness about, you know, the settlements and the settlers. But, but uh, at the same time, even if, you know, it's really first uh, when Joe Biden, you know, in the Washington Post uh, a few days ago, he wrote, you know, that um, not only uh, we need a new government in Gaza and in the West Bank, but, you know, we need um, basically measures against set settlements and sanctions against settlers. This is really first. In spite of this, I think that also uh, one, unfortunately, one of the major effects <laughs> of October 7 
has been to really re- reawake, you know, the, the trauma of the Shoah. And in this moment, I think it's very, very clear to whoever is here, uh, probably not to who is in Europe, but to whoever is here, that Israel is not going to listen to anyone this time, not even the United States. Uh, I think, you know, that really the majority of Israelis feel alone now, and they really feel that, you know, uh, in Europe especially, we don't understand, we don't want, or we, by the way, we don't understand what has been for them uh, October 7th. So they are not going to listen to, to anyone. And that's why I don't think that, you know, in this case, there will be any kind of international pressure uh, working in any way. Uh, Israel is going to do it its own way. Uh, Israel's going to do it its own way. Although, again, I come back to what we said at the outset, which is that, well, uh, with each day, first it was a four-day truce. Now we're approaching day seven. It's still happening. And as Qatar stated Tuesday, every day without gunfire is perhaps, perhaps yeah. an opportunity. Main focus right now is, and our hope, is to reach a sustainable truce that would lead to further negotiations and eventually to an end to, uh, to this iteration of violence, to, uh, to this war. And uh, we have always said that we need the push of the whole international community to make sure that uh, that happens. However, we are working with what we have. And what we have right now is a provision to the agreement that allows us to extend days as long as Hamas is able to uh, guarantee the release of at least 10 hostages uh, from, uh, from, this, uh, from their side. Jasmine El Kamal, uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, that takes us to what's going on right now. Who's negotiating with who and about what? Your reaction there when you when you listen to the spokesperson uh, for the Qatari government? Right. It's a it's a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest with you, Francois. Because of course I agree with the with the uh, you know assertion that every day without gunfire is a good day. But when we look at what is poised to happen after the ceasefire ends, when we look at what is awaiting uh, Palestinians living in Gaza after the day uh, after the truce ends, you kind of start to wonder, well, what was it all for anyway? I mean, of course, the hostages are going back, which is absolutely, you know, necessary. It's welcome. They should all be released, uh, you know, immediately, as we've been saying all along. But what happens the day after? What happens after the hostages are released? As you just showed in your program, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that he is dead set on continuing the war after the ceasefire, or sorry, not the ceasefire, but the temporary truce ends. Um, he restated his goals, his objectives. He said from the very beginning of this war, I have said that my objectives are to get the hostages back, and to make sure that Gaza is never a threat to Israel again. And so when you take those two things together, everything that's happening right now, the way it's unfolding makes perfect sense. He's doing what Netanyahu is doing what he can to get the hostages out, and he is prepared to go in afterwards to make sure, in his words, that Gaza does not pose a threat to Israel again. So that's why I say it's a bit of a mixed bag, because, of course, you know, we welcome, everybody welcomes the, the, the pause in fighting. But I have a very sort of um, dread, you know, feelings of dread about the day after and what that means for people living in Gaza. Well, we know that now, in private, the U.S. has been urging Israel to, to rethink aerial bombardments, particularly with so much of the population now displaced to the south of the Gaza Strip and airstrikes proving perhaps ineffective in accomplishing the stated aim of destroying militant tunnels uh, below ground. So, Jasmine, I, I ask you the, the, the question, is there a different way for Israel to uh, prosecute uh, its, its war with Hamas? Absolutely, Francois, 100 percent. I was I'm here in Berlin now. I, I normally live in London, as you know, but I was here for the last day and a half for a foreign policy conference in Berlin. And I was having this exact conversation yesterday with a prominent member of the German Bundestag, uh, who's very, very prominent on foreign policy. And we were talking about the fact that the U.S., Francois, simply does not have. And this is what we've seen over the last month and a half. The U.S. simply does not have have any leverage over this Israeli government. Netanyahu, in his 
uh, in his public statements and his reported private conversations with Likud members, he is bragging about the fact that the U.S. wanted him to do this and he did that. The U.S. did not want him to go in in the ground invasion the way he did. He did it anyway. The U.S. does not want X. He does Y. This is a bragging point for Netanyahu. So we also have to understand the mindset of the current Israeli government. People like Benjamin Netanyahu and Itamar ben, ben Gavir are not partners for peace because they're not interested in peace, as Francesca was uh, sorry, as your other uh, guest was describing earlier. Um, and so when we think about, you know, to, and to answer your question about who's negotiating with whom, normally Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has been the one discussing, you know, com in conversations with people in Israel and in the region. But however, the U.S. has recently deployed another very trusted person, former head of the CIA, Bill Burns. He has been the one negotiating with Qatar. He has been the one negotiating with the Israelis. He is obviously, he has very close ties with the head of the Mossad. It tells you something about who is important in the current Israeli equation, the foreign minister of Israel, who's normally Secretary of State uh, Blinken's counterpart, is out of the equation. He doesn't matter. The person who's in charge of this hostage situation is the head of the Mossad. He's in Benjamin Netanyahu's inner circle. And that's why they brought back Bill Burns, because he has relations and he has uh, sort of um, he, he, he has dealt with the head of the Mossad, obviously, in his previous job. So that's why they've brought him in. So in terms of who is they, responsible they brought him in. Does he have leverage? You said that the U.S. right now yeah, doesn't he, have leverage. The U.S. Yeah. doesn't have leverage over the, con the conduct of Israel in this war. Israel has said that it will do whatever it takes and whatever needs to be done to destroy Hamas. And that is what they will continue to do. A very minor subset of that. So just so I'm clear is the release of the hostages, and that is where Bill Burns is making progress. However, I want to come back to my original point, Francois, which is everything that's happening right now, basically we have to see it within the context of the fact that Israel is going to resume what it was doing before, despite U.S. objections, despite international objections, the day after all the hostages that they deem necessary to be released are released, they will be back in Gaza and we will see the horrors of the last month in Gaza happening again. On Thursday, the U.S. Secretary of State returns again to Israel. Now, at a NATO meeting in Brussels earlier, uh, Antony Blinken did not talk up uh, the prospect of turning a temporary truce into a more permanent ceasefire. Instead, he played his cards close to his chest. We'll discuss with Israel how it can achieve its objective of ensuring that the terrorist attacks of October 7th never happen again while sustaining an increasing humanitarian assistance and minimizing further suffering and casualties among Palestinian civilians. Hussein Ibish in French, we'd say yeah. that is a, a minimal service. Yes, that's right. Uh, and it's wise, actually, um, because I, I, I don't know that the U.S. has no leverage. I'm, I'm not sure I believe that at all. But I think it has limited leverage. And I think it has been hesitant to test the amount of leverage that it has in a very aggressive way with the Israelis. So I think that the, the tactic has been to move the needle, you know, in, in stages, right? And uh, I think the, the hostage deal that's currently being extended is basically Joe Biden's deal, more than anything else. The Qataris were the conduit, but he really was the one who got all the sides to agree to it. I think also there were moments when Israel came very close to say a preemptive strike against Hezbollah when Biden was the key figure in preventing that. I think he um, sort of delayed the attack on Gaza, on northern Gaza for quite a while on various different grounds. So he moves very cautiously and behind the scenes. But I think there is leverage. I think Netanyahu is, is sort of lying a bit when he brags about I did this and I did that and the Americans didn't want to. But I can personally point, I mean, I think anyone just with open sources can say that uh, they hear something that he wanted to do, and the Americans stopped him from doing it. Uh, there are uh, quite a few of those. And, and to Jasmine's well. point, so, that uh, Jasmine's uh, point about uh, the fact that there, uh, we're not perhaps underlining enough the fact that uh, the the head of the CIA for the second time is uh, is back in Qatar. No, she's absolutely right. Look, look, Bill Burns is the heavy gun in American diplomacy. He's the most experienced, capable 
potent diplomat the United States has. And to, to uh, bring him uh, into the forefront at this stage makes a lot of sense. Look, what, what we're seeing now is a, a potential moment. Uh, look, Yasmin is absolutely right. Everybody uh, in this panel is right. Israel is going to go back to this war very soon. Uh, they, there's no other choice. They're going to resume. They're going to take the war into southern Gaza, and they're going to do what they did in northern Gaza, maybe a slightly different way, but they want to grab the overground areas, and then at some point they're going to go into the tunnels, try to rescue their soldiers, and maybe flood the tunnels with Mediterranean seawater, or some other way render them non-functional. All of this is inevitable. At the same time, because of the public pressure on Netanyahu about the hostages, and the shift, uh, also pressure from the United States and Europe and others, about um, making the hostages a priority, we may be witnessing the morphing of this war into a war to free the hostages, which is an achievable goal, or a war to achieve the hostages, and as Yasmin was saying, a, a, a war coupling that with a kind of a decimation of Hamas. The original war aim, which he, Netanyahu continues to spout, which is Hamas will be destroyed, is impossible. As we've all been saying from the beginning, it's a brand. It can't be destroyed. But what it could do is it could be uh, cut down to size radically, rendered impotent for the immediate future, and uh, the hostages retrieved or in some way that issue uh, rendered re resolved. Once that's done, I think Israel could easily declare victory and leave if it made this award to free the hostages. And right now, there'd be a lot of support in Israel for that. Well, let me ask you this. If the international community is serious about reviving uh, uh, peace negotiations, about the so-called day after that yeah. the panel has yeah. also been talking about, uh, and, and it's to happen without Hamas, Haaretz yeah. newspaper columnist V. Barrel suggesting a throwback to 1982, when an end to Israel's yeah. bloody war with Lebanon was brokered, Thanks to a deal whereby PLO leader Yasser Arafat agreed to move his headquarters to Tunis. To Tunis. Uh, right. Is, is a scenario like that possible, Hussein Edish? It's not impossible at all. If, if the, here's one way you can parse the ending here. Uh, let's break it into two parts, right? The first question is, what is because Hamas can't be destroyed, what's Hamas leadership going to look like? You have the more extreme leaders... Uh, the authors of October 7th, who are on the ground in Gaza. And there's a list of them, the Israelis have it, and they can kill them, destroy them, capture them, whatever. There's another group of Hamas leaders who used to be in charge of the organization, but in, you know, in recent decades, they became the diplomatic wing of Hamas. For, they, they were expelled from Gaza, they went to Syria, then for complicated reasons ended up in Qatar. Now they're in Qatar. These guys were not I think, even aware of the October 7 attack. So it is entirely possible to kind of um, make them once again the external leadership of Hamas and have Hamas exist through those people under Qatari control. And at that point, if you then couple that with a resurrection of an international peace process where the PLO and the PA represent the Palestinians at some big to resurrect negotiations for a two-state solution, that might be a way of sweetening the pot enough to get the Palestinian Authority to be willing to go back into Gaza and bite that bullet. It's possible. If that's a, it, that's it's a possible, big you're saying, political victory for them. The, the Palestinian I? Authority, which is uh, based in Ramallah, Francesca Bori, uh, <clears throat> yeah. uh, you, you uh, 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 back in 2018, interviewed Yahya Sinwar, who's the operational head uh, uh, of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Uh, of course, the, the first question is, would he uh, agree to decamp? Um, you, you, might, you might send the Yahya Sinwar and all the Hamas leadership even to the moon, but exactly, you know, uh, what happened in, in 1982, you know, when, when the PLO leadership uh, was sent, you know, away, um, well, what happened? Uh, what happened is that in 1987, Hamas appeared, no? Uh, so um, Hamas might disappear, 
and you would get another Hamas with another name. I mean, Hamas is an idea, Hamas is an ideology. And exactly, you know, the example of the PLO is the right example. You know, Arafat at the time was viewed the same way Sinwar is viewed today as a, as a terrorist. And that's what happened. You know, in the end, he signed the, 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 the Oslo agreements. But in the end, you know, he, was, he had Hamas, you know, more radical than, than, than the PLO. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine El Kamal, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, as I was listening to, uh, and by the way, Francesca makes a very interesting and important point about Yasser Arafat having been sort of in the public eye perceived the same way that uh, Sinwar is perceived today. Uh, but I want to go back to what Hussein was saying about, you know, I. Of course, the 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 uh, sort of vision that Hussein sets out is the correct one. It, it it is one that you know we all hope would happen. But I do want to point out a couple of things, uh, uh, sort of as a pushback, Hussein, uh, yeah. in terms of the fact that. Um, if you look at public opinion polls, and many people incorrectly state that Palestinians supported Hamas before this war, that is factually incorrect. Poll yeah. after poll that was conducted in the Gaza Strip before this war, including one literally that was released on October 6th, I think, right before, yes. you know, the day before the Arab barometer. Uh, yep. You can look it up, and the, the authors wrote an article about it in Foreign Affairs magazine in the U.S. that showed that Palestinians were not supportive of Hamas at all. However, because of the way Israel has waged the war, which I have found so, you know, regardless of, you know, let alone the humanitarian concerns, strategically, strategically not helpful to the Israelis, because the way they have waged the war has actually led to an increase in support for Hamas, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well. And you know yeah. why that is? That is because Hamas is able to say two things right now, a month and a half into this war. The first is that they have put the Palestinian cause on the map when it was previously in danger of having been completely forgotten, including by Arab states that were willing to go into peace talks with Israel, the Abraham Accords, without fully addressing the Palestinian issue. That is no longer the case. It is back on the map in a way that it, I would argue has never been the case before across the world from Generation Z above. Gen Z and above. The second thing that they're able to say is that they've released hostages, uh, so, sorry, yeah. they've released prisoners for hostages at a rate of three to one, something that the Palestinian Authority has never been able to say. They've never yeah. been able to say we've gotten hostages released, you know? So, so the way that Israel is waging this war, I find very strategically incompetent because yeah. what they are doing is exactly the opposite of what they have stated so, their goals to be at the beginning of this war. This is what Hamas wanted. This is why they did October 7th. They <clears throat> exactly. were counting on the Israelis to act this way. And the Israelis are helping them every exactly. day. <clears throat> exactly. They set a trap. They set yeah. a trap. And Israel walked right into the trap. That's exactly right. And I see all yeah. the panel is <laughs> nodding. We're going to have to leave it there. Yes. <laughs> yes, because Hamas said it had a series of traps for the Israelis. The Israelis were expecting traps on the ground, but actually no, no. it was another type of trap. Political and they fell trap. into it. Exactly. It's a political sure. and strategic trap. Yeah. Uh, on yeah. that note of consensus, we'll leave it there. Uh, Shirley Sidpon, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Francesca Bori for being uh, with us uh, from Ramallah. Hussein Ibish in Washington. Uh, Jasmine Al-Kamal in Berlin. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.